So we've talked about molecules, we've talked about how atoms are constructed, we've talked about naming, different types of compounds, etc. We need to start getting into being able to identify an actual formula though, from experimental data. To do this, we're going to look at percent composition, empirical, and molecular formulas, and all of that will be defined momentarily. But first off, let's look at what we mean by percent composition. I want you to recall your junior high definition of percent. Percent is the part divided by the whole times 100%, where here, percent is my unit. If I want to know how many people are wearing a black t-shirt in a classroom, I would count how many people are wearing black, divided by the total number of students in the room, and times that by 100%. That would give me the percentage of students wearing a black t-shirt in the classroom. We're going to do something similar with the compounds to be able to figure out the percent composition of the compound. The difference here is that whereas I just counted the number of students wearing a specific colored shirt, when we're saying percent composition in chemistry, we mean percent by mass. How much of my compound is actually made up by this, the mass of a specific element or atom? We want percent by mass because remember, the individual atoms weigh something different. One atom of hydrogen does not weigh the same as one atom of oxygen. One atom of hydrogen is 1.008 AMU, whereas one atom of oxygen is 16 AMU. They have different numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so therefore, the, they will vary in their mass. I cannot compare the number of things. I have to compare it by mass. For example, what is the percentage of hydrogen in water? Tradi traditionally speaking, what most students want to do here is they want to say, okay, well, water is H2O. I have two hydrogen compared to two hydrogen atoms compared to three atoms overall times 100. That is absolutely incorrect. Don't do that because we need it percent by mass. What I need here is the mass of hydrogen atoms divided by the total mass of water and I'm going to multiply that by 100%. So I look on the table and I see hydrogen is 1.008 grams per mole and I have two hydrogens in the molecule. I add up the mass of water, again water, two hydrogens, two times 1.008 grams per mole, one oxygen, one times 16.00 grams per mole, overall gives me 18.02 grams per mole. Notice here your grams per mole will cancel out, so those will not have to be an issue in your calculation for units. Times 100% gives me an answer. Oop, I gotta look at the right spot. I'm sorry, I was looking at the next example. It does not give you an answer of two. It gives you an answer of 11.2%. So the answer here is letter A. Why D is missing off 66.7, I don't know. Probably, I, I have that on here. If you do this, you're going to get this answer, which is not correct, right? 11.2% is how much hydrogen, percent hydrogen in water, because it is based on mass. Hydrogen is really light compared to the oxygen. So the oxygen is contributing most of the bulk of that compound. We need to know this because when I'm analyzing things experimentally, I am analyzing things often by mass. I'm figuring out how much of a certain compound comes out on the other side and calculating backwards to what I originally started with. Let's look at another example. What is the percent nitrogen and ammonium phosphate? Notice here, I did not give you the formula of ammonium phosphate. So because we've already covered naming, you would have to recognize the formula for ammonium phosphate. Ammonium is one of our polyatomics. Phosphate is also a polyatomic. NH4 plus PO4 3 minus. Cross your charges here. This shows me that I need three ammoniums and one phosphate to make the overall compound. So the formula here, NH43PO4. I want to know the percent nitrogen in this compound. 
Remember what that three means? The three means three of these. So that means three nitrogens, 12 oxygens in this compound. So three times the mass of nitrogen, 14.01 grams per mole, divided by the total mass of the compound. Well, let's add that up. I've got three nitrogens, three times 14.01 grams per mole. I've got 12 hydrogens there, the three times the four on hydrogen. So 12 hydrogens is 12, 1.008 grams per mole. One phosphorus, one times 30.97 grams per mole. And four oxygen, four times 16.00 grams per mole. And let me just check, because I just did that by memory. I want to make sure I actually wrote phosphorus correctly, because now that I'm thinking about it, I'm not positive if I actually have that one memorized. I have many of them memorized just from practice, but table, pre-table. And again, if you ever need to look up, a, if you're on the internet, you need a um, great website, ptable.com. has an interactive periodic table. Yes, 30.97 grams per mole. Okay, I just want to make sure, because I, again, wasn't 100% sure if I remembered that one correctly or not. So when I add this up, I get a mass here, 149.1 grams per mole. Divided by 149.1 grams per mole. Again, keeping your molar mass to four sig figs overall is usually sufficient for the um, calculations you're going to do. Times 100%. Gives me... One second, I actually don't have this written out. I know what about what it is, but I don't know the exact value. Let's see, what do we have? Three times 14.01 divided by 28.21%. So this compound is basically 28% nitrogen. And again, that's because of the mass of the nitrogen. If I just looked at the compound, I have three nitrogens compared to three plus 12 is 15 plus phosphorus 16 plus oxygen 20. I have three atoms out of 20 atoms in the molecule, but almost 30% of it is due to nitrogen because nitrogen has a higher mass than like the 12 atoms of hydrogen. Okay, so it's just contributing more. Let's look at another example. Which element in pigment green seven, Cu, C32, H, C15, and eight has the greatest mass percentage? Well, first let's add up that thing. If I look at that, copper, I don't actually know copper, so I have to look this one up. Copper has a mass of 63.55 grams per mole. Carbon, I have 32 times 12.01 grams per mole. I have one hydrogen, 1.008 grams per mole. Chlorine, I have 15 of them, and that is 35.45 grams per mole. It's copper carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, and nitrogen, making sure I didn't miss any, eight nitrogen at 14.01 grams per mole. When I add that up, I'm going to get a molar mass here. This weird M like this, I call it a script M like this. This means molar mass in my shorthand. Molar mass is 1092.7 grams per mole. We're going to find soon why I have a shorthand for it, because we don't want to confuse it with meters or molality or molarity, all other units that have the capital M or a capital or lowercase m used for their abbreviation. If I figure out the mass percentage for each one, I'm going to find that copper is 5.816. Carbon is 35.17%. Hydrogen is 0.0922%. And yes, that is percent. It is a very small amount. It's one hydrogen. So one out of, you know, almost 1,100 for mass. It's a really small amount. 
nitrogen, 10.6%, or 26%, and chlorine is 48.66%. So, which one has the greatest mass percentage? Chlorine. Looking at the formula, some students are just going to naturally guess carbon. But why does it not? Well, there is 32 carbon. There's only 15 chlorine. But chlorine is more than double the mass of a carbon, right? So, it's actually going to counteract that effect and make it the greatest mass percentage. In this question, I could possibly guess my way through it thinking of it that way realizing that 15 chlorine would be heavier than 32 carbon. But again, it's best just to do it by math. To take, so, you know, take each value here, this divided by 1092.7 um, times 100% is how I got the 5.86%. This quantity divided by 1092.7 times 100% is how I got 35.17. Same thing down the line. And that's how I found each value. And this is getting harder to read. I apologize. I need a better color on here. That should be a divide symbol there. And that's how I found each one. So you may be able to logic your way through it, but truthfully, it's best just to practice the calculation because practicing it is going to solidify in your brain that it is, in fact, percent by mass, and you're more likely to get it right long term. Why do I care about all that? I care about all that because of empirical molecular formulas. I need to understand percent composition to be able to do empirical molecular formulas. A molecular formula shows the number of atoms of each element in a molecule. The molecular formula is the complete formula. How many things do I have? Such as C6H12O6, which is glucose. I have six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms in that molecule. That is the complete formula. It shows I have all the numbers of each element in the molecule. An empirical formula, on the other hand, is the smallest whole number, multiple ratio of elements in a compound. So... Keywords here that I remember to is smallest, whole number, and multiple ratio. I realize it's most of the definition of it, but by remembering that, I'm able to do the calculations and remember the next step for everything I have to do. For example, glucose, C6H12O6, would have an empirical formula of CH2O. It's the smallest whole number multiple ratio. If I have six carbons to 12 hydrogen to six oxygen, the smallest ratio to represent that would be CH2O. The other example listed on our slide, the molecular formula of benzene is C6H6. The empirical formula of benzene would be CH. There is one carbon for every one hydrogen. It is the smallest whole number multiple ratio of the elements in the compound. Suppose the compound was found with an empirical formula of CH2O, but it had a molar mass of 120 grams per mole. What is the molecular formula of this compound? How am I going to figure that out? By having the empirical formula CH2O, I, the formula could be CH2O. It could, I mean, technically that could be the actual formula of it. That is a compound. We could have C2H4O2, C3H6, O3, um, C4H8, O4, C5H10, O5, etc. We can keep going. It, that's all showing the same ratio. This is all one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. How do I figure it out? When I'm told the overall molar mass, I can quickly figure out the molecular formula of the compound. I know the CH2O weighs 30 grams per mole, approximately. Why do I know that? Carbon, 12.01 grams per mole. Two hydrogen, two times 1.008 grams per mole. And one oxygen, 16 grams per mole. Adding this up, I'm going to get about 30 point, 
0.03 grams per mole. So about 30 grams per mole. I'm rounding down to 30 grams per mole because the molar mass says 120. So the molar mass of this compound is actually 120 grams per mole, but the molar mass of this is just 30 grams per mole. That's a difference in the factor of four. What that means is my molecular formula is four times that of my empirical formula. So four times CH2O. C4, H8, O4. Four times that of the empirical formula. An empirical formula, again, is the smallest whole number multiple ratio of the elements. Percent composition is percent by mass. We use this information to help us solve empirical molecular formulas from experimental data all the time. One hint, and we'll do a couple different examples here, but one hint is if you're given the percent composition and the molar mass, the problem is even easier. Instead of starting with 100 grams of unknown, we start with one mole. That's going to make more sense when we start doing the problems. You're going to understand what I mean by assuming we have 100 grams, if we have percentage, how we factor that in with the molar mass, etc. We're going to do all of that in just a sec. But, so this sentence may not make much sense yet, but it will soon. The most important things here right now, empirical formula, smallest whole number, multiple ratio. Percent composition is percent by mass. So let's work some examples. What is the empirical formula of a compound which consists of 52.13% carbon, 13.14% hydrogen, and 34.73% oxygen by mass? If you look at this, 52.13 plus 13.14 plus 34.73 all add up to 100, which is convenient. We, to simplify this question, we are going to assume that we have 100 grams of the unknown. By doing that, if I assume 100 grams, that means I have 52.13 grams of carbon, I have 13.14 grams of hydrogen, and I have 34.73 grams of oxygen. That's going to make my life a lot easier. So if I'm given percentages like that and they can add up to 100, I'm going to assume we have 100 grams of unknown. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is figure out how many moles I have of each thing. To figure out empirical formula, I need the smallest whole number multiple ratio. So I can't compare grams. I have to compare moles. I need the moles to compare and find a multiple ratio. Number of moles of carbon. If I have 52.13 grams of carbon, I know that I'm trying to get to moles, which so it's going to go on the numerator, and I'm trying to cancel grams, so it's going to go on the denominator. I know based on the periodic table that there's 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. 4.341 moles of carbon in this compound. I'm going to do the same thing for hydrogen and oxygen. Number of moles of hydrogen, 13.14 grams of hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen. I look on the table and I see it as 1.008 grams of hydrogen for every one mole of hydrogen. I have 13.04 moles of hydrogen. And oxygen. Number of moles of oxygen. I have 34.73 grams of oxygen. One mole of oxygen weighs 16 grams. Again, these grams canceled out this way got me moles. Grams canceled out, got me moles. Grams are canceling out, giving me moles. So that's why I've got moles over grams here. I'm trying to convert to moles. 2.171 moles of oxygen. Now I'm going to look, this is not the final answer, but I'm going to look at these three numbers. So now I've got the moles of each species. But what I want is the smallest whole number mole to mole ratio. So I'm looking for smallest whole number, mole to mole ratio. So I've got to divide one mole by another. In order to do that, though, I want whole numbers. I'm going to find the smallest of these three numbers. This is the smallest value. And 
and I'm going to divide all of them by the smallest value. Carbon, 4.341 moles of carbon to 2.171 moles of oxygen. This gives me a value of 2.002, which I'm going to round to 2, because I need a whole number. This means that for every 2 carbons, I have 1 oxygen. Hydrogen, 13.04 moles of hydrogen to 2.171 moles of oxygen. I get 6.006, .006, which I'm going to round to 6, I want whole numbers. This means for every six hydrogen, I need one oxygen. And of course, you could do this down here, but it should, you know, you don't have to show this part of it. 2.17 moles of oxygen to 2.17 moles of oxygen. Better give you one. Like one of them has to give you one. If you didn't get an answer of one, you didn't do your math correctly. But this is correlated. So this means that two carbon is equivalent to six hydrogen as well. This is giving me my empirical formula. Two carbon, six hydrogen, and one oxygen to the compound. I have found the moles of each species. I've divided all of them by the smallest of the number of moles I have. That gave me multiple ratio and it, it forced me to have whole numbers. Or it forced me to have not decimals, but um, bigger numbers, right? I don't want to divide by the biggest number because that's going to be fractions everywhere. I'm going to divide by the smallest of the numbers, and then I'm going to round all of those numbers to whole numbers and see the ratio of the species to one another. That is my empirical formula. Two carbons to six hydrogens to one oxygen. Let's work another example. A certain compound consists of 38.70% carbon, 9.74% hydrogen, and 51.56% oxygen by mass. The molar mass of this compound is 67.07 grams per mole, sorry, 62.07 grams per mole. What is the molecular formula of this compound? So what's important here? Well, we're given the molar mass and we're told we have these percentages. We could absolutely solve this like we did previously, find the empirical formula, and then scale up like we did in the example a couple slides ago. But instead, we are told the molar, uh, molar mass of the compound. When you are told molar mass, it's actually easier to assume you have one mole of unknown. Because one mole of my unknown weighs 62.07 grams. I know that 38.7% of that compound is carbon. That means 38.7%, 70% of 62.07 is how much carbon I have in that grams. 9.74% of 62.07 is how much hydrogen I have in grams. 51.56% of 62.07 grams is how many grams of oxygen I have in one mole of that compound. So I can use this to find the mass and then convert to moles. And it's just a little bit easier. It's a few less steps than if I did it the other way. Again, if you're confused, you can come see me for help, but otherwise you can do it like we did in the previous example where we assume 38.7 grams of carbon, 9.74 grams of hydrogen, 51.56 grams of oxygen, find empirical formula, and then scale up to molecular formula. You can do that as well. But I'm going to show you the, what I would consider to be the quicker way, assuming we have one mole of unknown. Still going to find the number of moles of each species. Number of moles of carbon... If I have 62.07 grams, so I have one mole of the compound, 62.07 grams of that compound, and 38.70% of it is carbon, the fractional percentage of that would be 0 0.3870. This right here represents the mass of carbon in the compound. I'm going to multiply that, one mole of carbon, to 12.01 grams of carbon. This gives me two moles of carbon. Number of moles of hydrogen. The compound, one mole of the compound would be 62.07 grams. And I have 0.9074 um, fractional or 9.74% hydrogen in the compound. Again, this represents the mass of hydrogen in the compound. One mole of hydrogen. 
to 1.008 grams of hydrogen. Gives me six moles of hydrogen. And number of moles of oxygen, 62.07 grams, or one mole of that compound, times 0.5156, representing the percent of oxygen in the compound. This is the mass of oxygen, times one mole of oxygen, to 16.00 grams of oxygen. This is giving me two moles of oxygen. This is real easy, right? This just gave you my answer pretty quickly without a lot of extra calculation. Two carbon, six hydrogen, and two oxygen is my molecular formula. If I had done it the other way, I would have found CH3O to be empirical. I would have had to find the molar mass of this and then find the molecular formula. By comparing the molar mass of the actual compound to the molar mass of the empirical formula. So this method is just a little bit faster. It cuts out a few steps, um, getting you to the molecular formula a little bit faster. Let's work some more examples. A compound that contains only carbon, hydrogen, oxygen is 49.4% carbon and 35 or 3.56% hydrogen by mass. So it only contains carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. But it's only telling me a percentage for carbon and hydrogen. Well, if it only contains three things, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, it's giving me percentages for two things. That means the difference has to be the percentage of hydrogen or percentage of oxygen. 49.4 and 3.56 add up to 53%, 53.0%. Therefore, I must have 47.0% being oxygen. Because again, it's giving me this, but it's telling me I have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen present. I am given the percentages, but I am not given the molar mass of the substance. So I am going to assume... 100 gram sample. Same process we followed before. I'm going to figure out the number of moles of each species. So, number of moles of carbon. If I have 49.4% carbon, I'm assuming 100 grams. That means I have 49.4 grams of carbon. One mole of carbon is 12.01 grams of carbon. This gives me 4.113 moles of carbon. Same thing for hydrogen, number of moles of hydrogen. I have 3.56%, so 3.56 grams of hydrogen. One mole of hydrogen to 1.008 grams of hydrogen. Gives me 3.53 moles of hydrogen and number of moles of oxygen. Should be an L there for moles. Number of moles of oxygen, I found by process, like by, you know, just um, process elimination, I know that if it's 49.4% carbon, 3.56% hydrogen, then it has to be 47.0% oxygen. So 47.0 grams of oxygen, convert that to moles of oxygen. 16.00 grams of oxygen, and this gives me 2.94 moles of oxygen. Right now I'm comparing these three numbers, 4.13 moles, 3.53 moles, and 2.94 moles. Shrink this and move it out of the way a little bit. So I need to divide by the smallest number. This is the smallest number. I'm going to divide this by 2.94. This gives me 1.40. Now, when you're really close to a whole number, you round. When you're not really close to a whole number, you do not round. This is not really close to a whole number. I am not rounding down. Divided by 2.94 moles 
gives me 1.20. That is not close enough to a whole number to round, okay? We're going to have to multiply. We're going to have to, and then of course, you know, this just gives me one. We're going to have to multiply all of these by a factor to bring them close to a whole number. If I take 1.4 times two, that gives me 2.8, not close enough. Times three is gonna give me, what, three, 4.2, not close enough. Times four, not close enough. If I multiply it by five though, 1.40 times five is going to give me an answer of seven. 1.20, times five is going to give me an answer of six. So sometimes you have to play with it a little bit until you can get to a, very, to a whole number. You have to find the common multiplet that will bring them to the whole number. 1.40 times two brought me to a value with a 0.8. 1.40 times three brings me to a value that has a final answer of 0.2. 1.40 times four brings me to an answer that's a final value of 0.6. Not near a whole number. But if I do one, um, 1.40 times 5, I get to an answer of 7, exact. I then check that. Now that I found a whole number, I'm going to check it with the next number. I'm going to say, okay, well, what about 1.20 times 5? That brings me to a number of 6. So yes, those are the whole numbers. What that means, though, is again, this one has been 2.94 moles of O divided by 2.94 moles to give me the 1. This also has to be multiplied by 5, giving me an over answer of 5. C7, H6, O5. I find my answer here, letter A. It is your lowest whole number ratio of the moles to each other. They need to be whole numbers. They were not whole numbers until I multiplied by 5. So it may not look low, but if I look at that, I cannot simplify that further. C7, H6, O5 does not have a lowest common denominator here, I cannot simplify this down. That is my lowest ratio of the elements to one another. So sometimes you're going to get data where you're going to have to multiply this answer by some factor to reach whole numbers for all the species. They must be multiplied by the same factor. I can't multiply one by one factor, one by another, because it is the ratios of the elements to one another. What is the empirical formula of a compound that contains only iron and oxygen and is 27.6% oxygen? Well, if it's 27.6% oxygen, that must mean it's 72.4% iron. I'm going to assume 100 gram sample. Because that gives me 27.6 um, grams of oxygen and 72.4 grams of iron. Find the number of moles of oxygen, 27.6 grams of oxygen, one mole of oxygen to 16 grams of oxygen will give me 1.725 moles. Do the same thing for iron, number of moles of iron, 72.4 grams of iron, one mole of iron, 55.85 grams of iron for every mole. That's from the periodic table. This gives me 1.30 moles. I find the smallest number, and I see that 1.3 is smaller than 1.725. So I'm going to divide this by 1.30 which gives me an answer of 1.33. Of course, when I divide that by 1.30, it just gives me a value of 1. 1.33 cannot be rounded. I have to find the multiplet that brings it to a whole number. 1.33 times 2 gives me 2.66. Not it. 1.33 times 3, though, brings me to 4. So I also need to multiply this by 3, giving me 3. Fe3, O4 is my final answer here. What about combustion analysis? Combustion is the other way we can do the calculations. And students really don't like combustion analysis because they just seem to be difficult problems. I'm not saying they're, they're easy, but there is a process you need to follow. We're following the same process we were doing in the other examples, 
but now we're looking at the products formed and calculating backwards to the reactants that made those products. Combustion is where I burn something. I'm gonna burn a sample and I'm gonna collect whatever product comes off of it. So in combustion analysis, we can see here what's happening. The process, I like this um, picture from your book because it kind of explains the process of the, that you're gonna follow to solve the math. You're gonna determine the mass of the sample, burn the sample in oxygen, determine the mass of combustion products, determine the number of moles of each combustion product, find the mass of oxygen through um, law of conservation of mass, really, use percentages to calculate the moles of all the samples, divide the moles by each, um, to find the overall empirical formula, and then ne if needed, multiply to find a true, the actual empirical formula or eventually molecular formula. So we've got a sample in here, some kind of sample that we're gonna burn in the presence of oxygen. This sample you're burning may have all kinds of things in it. Um, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen are very common. We're going to do examples with sulfur and nitrogen, but you can really have anything in it. Anything can, if it can be burned, then you can have it. The trick to these questions, though, is that we, have, can't, we may have oxygen in the sample itself. We are definitely adding oxygen as a other reactant from the outside. And so we have to kind of pay attention to where, how much oxygen we have. How do we figure out how much oxygen is in the actual sample? And we're going to do that by um, a process of elimination kind of thing. Different ways we can absorb things here. So we see, it's hard to see here, but this says H2O absorber, CO2 absorber. So as the hydrogen is reacted in the system, it forms water with the extra oxygen in the sample or even the oxygen um, that's being added from the outside. So hydrogen is going to form water. The carbon is being used to form carbon dioxide. And then other elements that um, are in there can also be detected through other means. Biggest thing to this, and again, we're going to see this in the math very soon, but the biggest thing is that the carbon in our sample is converted to CO2. So we use the mass of CO2 to find the moles of carbon in the original sample. The hydrogen in the sample is converted to water, so we use the mass of water to find the moles of hydrogen from the original sample. O2, again, is added in excess. To determine the moles of O2 in the compound, we subtract the mass of carbon hydrogen from the mass of the sample, the original sample, and convert that to moles of oxygen. Nitrogen can be determined by the production of NH3 into a separate sample. Other elements can also be analyzed in a similar fashion. Such as like, um, so like, let's see, carbon goes to CO2. Hydrogen goes to H2O. Nitrogen, you'll often analyze NH3. Um, sulfur, may, you may analyze H2S, sometimes SO2, etc. Different things can be analyzed. So, first example, an unknown compound consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. When a 1.125 gram sample of the unknown was analyzed by combustion analysis, 1.649 grams of CO2 and 0.675 grams of H2O were formed. If the molar mass of the unknown is 180.2 grams per mole, what is the molecular formula? Okay, one thing, 180.2 grams per mole, pretty much a dead giveaway, C6H12O6, okay? Glucose is 180.2 grams per mole. If you see 180.2, it's probably glucose. We still have to prove it, but to me, that's a huge giveaway. Seeing 180 tells me glucose. Let's see if we're actually correct. What do we have here? We have some sample. So we've got this sample that's 1.125 grams. We know that it's got carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in it. When analyzed, so, and then we say combustion analysis. Combustion means that I know I've burned it and formed CO2 and water. So I know that I formed CO2. I know I formed water. Specifically, I formed 1.649 grams of CO2 and 0 0.675 grams of water. I'm going to use that information to calculate back, figure out how much oxygen, um, how much hydrogen was in sample carbon, and eventually back to how much um, oxygen was in the original sample. We haven't learned balancing equations yet, but generally speaking, what we've done is we've taken some compound with an unknown amount of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we've burned it in the presence of oxygen, and we form CO2 and water. This is a combustion analysis reaction. First thing I want to do, find the number of moles of carbon. All of the carbon went into making the CO2. 1.649 grams of CO2. I'm going to convert this back to moles of carbon. We learned how to do this in the last chapter. 
I know that one mole of CO2 weighs 44.01 grams of CO2. Why? Because I added up from the PR table. Two oxygens and one carbon, 44.01 grams per mole. I know that for every one mole of CO2, there is one mole of carbon. Mathematically, that step does not matter, but if you want full credit on analysis questions, you will write that down because that is showing me my conversions. Grams of CO2, moles of CO2, I'm into moles of water. Or sorry, moles of carbon. 0 0.03747 moles of carbon, which is what I need, right? I need moles of carbon so I have to find the multiple ratio. Same thing for hydrogen. Number of moles of hydrogen. I know that all of my hydrogen was used to convert into water. 0 0.675 grams of H2O. Convert that to moles of H2O. Again, I have to convert to moles of H2O first because that is the mass of water, not the mass of hydrogen. H2O is 18.0 grams per mole. Now I've got moles of H2O. Now I can convert to moles of hydrogen. For every one mole of H2O, there are two moles of hydrogen. This is a very common thing to miss. Heck, I even miss it when I'm doing calculations sometimes. Do not forget to put a two there. Okay, there is two eight hydrogens for every one mole of H2O. This gives me 0 0.0749 moles of hydrogen. Now, right now I could figure out the moles of carbon and moles of hydrogen, but I really can't because I don't know how many moles of oxygen I have. I need that before I can figure out the multiple ratio of the species because I don't know if oxygen is going to have the smallest number of moles. But how am I going to find the moles of oxygen? I know my mass of unknown. is equal to the grams or mass of carbon plus the mass of um, hydrogen plus the mass of oxygen because of law of conservation of mass. I know they have to add up to the whole thing. I know that my mass of my unknown is 1.25 grams. How can I find mass of carbon and hydrogen or oxygen? Well, I know how many moles of carbon I have. Therefore, I can figure out very quickly how many grams of carbon I have. I'm going to take this, multiply it by 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. This is going to give me 0 0.4500 grams of carbon. I'm do the same thing for hydrogen. Take this value, multiply it by 1.008 grams of hydrogen for every one mole of hydrogen. This gives me 0 0.0755 grams of hydrogen. Now I can algebraically solve for the mass of oxygen. My mass of oxygen is going to be equal to 1.125 grams, the mass of the total sample, minus 0 .40, um, 0 0.4500 grams, which is the mass of carbon, minus 0 0.0755 grams, which is the mass of hydrogen. This gives me 0 0.5995 grams of oxygen. Now, I have absolutely run out of room, so I need to shrink some of this stuff out of the way. Let's just put you here. Now I know my mass of oxygen. Now I can use that to find my moles of oxygen. So number of moles of oxygen, 0 0.5995 grams of oxygen. I know that one mole of oxygen is 16 grams of oxygen. Don't mess up here with your diatomics. In this case, I am literally looking at what is the mass of, you know, one mole of just oxygen, not diatomic. Same for hydrogen. It's not a diatomic in this point. It is just oxygen, just hydrogen. This gives me 0 
3747 moles of oxygen. I'm going to compare the three. So carbon, I get 0 0.03747 moles. Hydrogen, 0 0.0749 moles. And oxygen, 0 0.03747 moles. This is my smallest number. So I'm going to divide. Oh, sorry, that is not my smallest number. I can read, I promise. Um, the carbon hug, these are my smallest numbers. They match. Smallest number. I was definitely not reading that correctly. I apologize. These are my smallest numbers, right? They match. Makes it convenient. I'm going to divide everything by 0 0.03747 moles. That gives me 1.03747 moles. That gives me a value of 2.03747 moles. Gives me a value of 1. Again, I want whole numbers here. 1, 2, 1. This is my empirical formula. C, H2O. I know that the mass of my molecular formula is 180.2. The molar mass of my empirical formula is 30 grams per mole. If I take 180.2 grams per mole, divide that by 30 grams per mole, I get a value of 6. That means my molecular formula C6H12O6. I take this 6 and multiply this entire compound by that value. Molecular formula C6H12O6. Again, we did confirm, yes, it is in fact glucose, which is what I suspect based on the mask. We still need to be able to prove that. Let's do one more example like this. A 1 gram sample of an unknown compound containing only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen was analyzed through combustion analysis and yielded 1.446 grams of CO2 and 0 0.7106 grams of H2O. What is the compound's empirical formula? We're going to say, follow the same process. So we're going to say, okay, well, how much carbon do I have? Number of moles of carbon. I'm going to start with my CO2. 1.446 grams of CO2. One mole of CO2 weighs 44.01 grams. I know that there is one mole of carbon for every one mole of CO2. Again, numerically, that does not matter, but that conversion absolutely is vital to show that you understand the comparison of the carbon to the CO2. So it would be required when showing your work. 0 0.03286 moles of carbon. Because I'm going to need it anyway, I'm going to go ahead and write it now. So if I took this and multiplied it by 12.01 grams of carbon to one mole of carbon, I get 0.3946 grams of carbon. Same thing for hydrogen. Number of moles of hydrogen. I'm going to start with my water. Let's see, I have 0 0.7106 grams of water. One mole of water weighs 18.02 grams. There are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of H2O. And this gives me an answer of 0 0.07887 moles of hydrogen. Again, because I know I'm going to need it, times 1.008 grams of hydrogen to one mole of hydrogen. This gives me 0 0.07950 grams of hydrogen. Now my grams of oxygen. It's gonna be my total compound minus the mass of carbon minus the mass of hydrogen. I see that that would give me a mass of 0 0.5259 grams of oxygen. Convert that to moles. One mole of oxygen is 16 grams of oxygen. 
excuse me, a numerical value, 0 0.03287 moles of oxygen. So for carbon, I have 0 0.03286 moles. Hydrogen, 0 0.07887 moles. So carbon is currently the smallest amount. Oxygen, 0 0.3287 moles. Carbon and oxygen are basically the same. Carbon is slightly smaller. Divided by 0 0.03286 gives me a value of 1. Divided by 0 0.03286 gives me a value of 2.4. divided by 0 0.03286 gives me a value of 1. Now i got to figure out what to multiply 2.4 by to get a whole number. So 2.4 by 2 times 2 is 4.8, times 3 is going to give me a decimal place of a 0 0.2, times 4 would be a decimal place of 0 0.6, times 5 would be a decimal place of 0. It's because 4 times 5 is 20. So I recognize I need to multiply all of these by 5. 2.4 times 5 gives you 12. Overall, my empirical formula, C5, H12, O5. Students don't like combustion analysis. They are harder problems to do. Learn the pattern. Take your CO2, find your carbon moles, find your carbon mass. Take your water, find your... Um, Take your water, find your moles of hydrogen. Remember the two to one ratio here, okay? Um, find your moles of hydrogen, find your mass of hydrogen. Take the mass of carbon, mass of hydrogen, subtract that from the original sample. That will give you the mass of your oxygen sample specifically. Find the moles of oxygen. Now you can find your ratios. Do not assume you are rounding unless you are very close to a whole number. Things like 2.01 would round to 2. But things like 2.2 do not round to 2. So you've got to be careful when you're rounding these, okay? They should be very close to a whole number when you're doing the math.